Slow economic growth is never good news for Democratic leaders, never mind the sledgehammer that COVID-19 has taken to economic prosperity. And according to economist Ambiza Moyo, Democratic leaders facing tough decisions such as the ones ahead aren't always apt to make policy that goes beyond what will successfully get them through the next election. Will the pandemic push them to think bigger and longer term? Well, with us to consider that, in New York, New York, Dan Bizamoyo, economist and author of Edge of Chaos, Why Democracy is Failing to Deliver Economic Growth and How to Fix It. Dan Bizamoyo, it's always great of you to make time for us here on TVO. How are you managing? Nice to see you. We're alive. We're fingers crossed uh, that we all get safely out of this uh, pandemic. Here, here to that. Now, you live, of course, in the United States, but you're originally from Zambia, and I gather you traveled there recently. So let's start with that. What do you think young, educated Zambians make of American democracy in the year 2021? <laughs> Well, look, the truth of the matter is that um, there are a lot of questions. Even before the pandemic hit in earnest in 2020, there was a lot of concern that a lot of the global problems that the world was facing, whether it was the financial crisis of 2008, um, the sort of skepticism around democracy that we saw in Europe, um, sort of uh, short-term decision-making that had led to uh, immigration concerns, uh, but also just a general backlash uh, politically with populism, breakup of uh, EU in terms of Brexit and obviously the rise of uh, Donald Trump, all of these things seem to be problems that have emanated in liberal democratic societies. Meanwhile, the narrative coming out of countries that have deprioritized democracy, such as China, seemed to be much more um, compelling. Um, they had economic growth on a sturdy path, um, and certainly we didn't see the policy volatility that we've seen in the West. So certainly a lot of questions. I wouldn't say we should throw the ba proverbial baby out with the bathwater, but there have been a lot of questions around the efficacy of democracy, particularly in dealing with uh, the challenges that lie ahead. I do find that a bit distressing, but I wonder, and of course this is a terrible overgeneralization, but do you think if they had to choose between authoritarian communism, Chinese style, with that kind of capitalism, and market-oriented democratic capitalism, the likes of which they practice in the country you're in right now, is there any question which way they'd go? Oh, I think there are questions, um, but you know the truth of the matter is that we're never faced with sort of a uh, uh, a sort of a, a, a sort of a double dilemma. Uh, as you've described it. Um, there are elements of market capitalism um, and democratic principles that are practiced in China. And in the same way, um, we know that governments in the West, including the United States, do step in um, in a much more state-like intervention, whether it's through CFIUS, so the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or just stepping in when there are times of crises, as we've seen during the pandemic. So this, is, this kind of binary option doesn't really exist. Um, and I think that there is a sense across many emerging markets that for low levels of economic development, you do want a government that is long-term thinking, quite sturdy and predictable, um, and actually is quite uh, deliberate and thoughtful about making uh, trade-offs uh, in, that are uh, much more difficult to make, I would say, in, in Western society, where society is much more complicated. Um, the issues of intergenerational uh, concerns, the political aspect really seeps in in a much more binary fashion, as we've seen in the United States and elsewhere. And I guess you did point out in your book the fact that if you look at countries like China or Singapore or even Chile back in the 70s and 80s under Augusto Pinochet, Democracy was not exactly the prerequisite for robust economic growth. So the old maxim of free markets and free people, not so strong anymore? Uh, maybe not as correlated as one might think. We, As you know, um, we've only had democracy for about 1% of human history, according to Freedom House. And we, really, even today, only 30% of the world's population lives in liberal democratic environments. So um, that's to say that, we've, we, you know, it's in, in many respects... The liberal order is an aberration, um, and by and large, if you believe in mean reversion, society has tended to be much more uh, state-led in terms of government playing an incredibly important role, not just in terms of uh, times of crisis or not just in terms of delivery of public goods, but also as an arbiter of capital and labor. Um, but at the same time, uh, we have seen, uh, as you've alluded to, uh, the, this, this real question of economic success 
for um, uh, for non-democratic states that I think there's something for us to learn, especially when for long-term problems that we're dealing with today. You were here in our studio pre-pandemic. I guess we're going back a few years right now, talking about The Edge of Chaos, your aforementioned book. And, um, and you wrote this in the book. Liberal democratic capitalism itself has become weak, corrupt, and oblivious to its own ailments. What are the ailments that you think we're oblivious to at the moment? Well, you know, perhaps less oblivious now, but I think fundamentally the issue is short-termism, which is deeply embedded in the political structure of liberal democracy. Um, I am not a person who thinks that we can't solve these problems, but I think it's very important for us to understand that virtually all of the problems that we're dealing with, we were dealing with before COVID and we will continue to deal with post-COVID, are long-term intergenerational problems. Things like technology and the risk of a jobless underclass, massive demographic shifts that have left 90% of the world's population in the emerging markets, and that can have meaningful impact in terms of immigration climate change, income inequality, the debt levels that we're carrying. I mean, these are all issues that we need to address, but these are long-term intergenerational problems. But at the same time, we've got public policymakers that are rewarded for short-term thinking because the electoral process is uh, is one that is very short in the United States every two years um, and elsewhere, even in places like Europe where it's every five years, is delinked or is mismatched from the uh, long-term problems that we have. And so you've got this gulf and this delta between the long-term problems and the short-term political thinking, uh, which is perfectly rational, but is not gonna do justice to solve these long-term problems. Well, you could add Canada to the list when we have a minority government as we do right now, because there's talk of election all the time, uh, because yeah. who knows, parliament could fall at any moment. But having said that, um, I think the fourth quarter growth rates in Canada were something like 9.6% which would be outstanding if we could repeat that year after year after year after year. Wouldn't many of the problems that you just described be solved if, in fact, democ democracies could do that? Oh, yes, absolutely. And you know, if you ask me what exactly is the biggest problem that the global economy is facing right now is the lack of economic growth. What you're describing is a rebound. It is not a recovery. Um, we just experienced a massive aggregate demand shock. By that, I mean we shut down everything and in that respect, um, essentially shut down the world's economy. Um, so we expect there to be an enormous uptick in, uh, in, in economic growth this year um, based on the fact that we're all going to be let out and we'll have our vaccines and uh, we'll be able to go to restaurants and see friends and family and uh, et cetera, et cetera, go to the movies. Um, but the fundamental problems that I outlined for you have not gone away. And those aspects are a massive drag on uh, future economic growth. And just to illustrate, um, debt to GDP ratio right now globally is over 300%. Um, in places like the United States, it's over 100% debt to GDP ratio. We know, according to literature, that above 60% debt to GDP ratio, you start to see growth rates decline um, to less than 2% per year. Well, at 2% per year, you're not able to uh, really put a meaningful dent in poverty. Uh, and in fact, the, the rough estimate is that in order to double per capita incomes in one generation, just 25 years, you need to be growing by at least 3%. So I'm euphoric for this year. But if you start to look at um, the forecasts for growth longer term, it, this picture becomes very murky very quickly. And I think we still have a lot of work to do on those structural factors. And democracy is not particularly equipped to deal with them. Well, let me, uh, let me get your take on what uh, Joe Biden and the Democrats, anyway, in Congress just managed to achieve, which was a $1.9 trillion COVID relief plan. We are hearing projections that that is going to cut the national poverty rate in the United States by a third. This could be an historically important achievement. If that happens, I mean, doesn't that speak to some of the issues you just referred to? Well, I don't know what that means for education. I don't know, which by the way, in the United States, uh, this generation of Americans is for the first time in the history of the country, less educated than the preceding generation. I don't know what that means for infrastructure, which is the backbone of economic success. Um, but the United States infrastructure is graded a D plus by the American Civil Engineers Society. I don't know what the, the package 
um, actually means for a new green economy. These are obviously all aspects that are addressed in some respect, but we still have a lot of work to do. The savings rate in the United States is about 15%. So people are still worried about putting their money to work and investing in this economy. So will it be a shock to the system having this 1.9 trillion seep into the economy? Absolutely it will. But we have a lot of fundamental questions that still need to be addressed. How are we going to pay back the debt? How are we going to solve climate change? What about income inequality? You're seeing the stock market on an, almost on a daily basis hitting new highs, creating a risk of a K-shaped recovery where the people um, at the top and who are stock market investors having higher returns um, than people at the bottom level. So we still have a long way to go. And I think it's really important that we focus on those long-term problems and not get excited about a, what could be seen as a Band-Aid solution. Let's do this excerpt from your book again on what kind of reforms could be introduced by Western democracies. And here's your warning. These proposals may be met with skepticism from those who believe that whatever the time, whatever the question, the answer is always more freedom, not less. Yet, you write, it is important to recognize that unfettered liberty carries with it costs that are weighing down on economic prospects of the world. These proposals would restrict the behavior of politicians, limit the options available to voters, and indeed narrow the scope of the electorate itself. But these are necessary constraints at a time when politicians and voters too free to act have acted too often in short-sighted ways. Let's start to uh, pick that apart, shall we? What are your ideas for how to limit the behavior of politicians? Well, as you may recall from the book, I have 10 proposals. Um, the good news is all 10 proposals are drawn from live um, sort of uh, experiments, li actually live policies that are in, play, in place around the world. So this is not me cooking up crazy policies in my kitchen. These are real um, approaches to democracy uh, that get at the heart of this long-term versus short-term problem that I've already addressed. So for example, things like binding government over long time is something that's quite popular in Europe. You have policymakers agree to a set of, uh, of policies. So let's say the Obamacare uh, initiative, and you get the the next uh, um, uh, administration uh, basically is, has their hands tied um, at least for a certain period of time. So that's one example. Um, another example is you start to pay policymakers, as we do in the private sector, for long-term thinking. Um, by that, I, and this is an example taken from Singapore, um, government officials are paid um, based on outcomes over the long term, not based on short terms uh, on a year by year basis or even indeed a quarter by quarter basis. So I think we need to start thinking about how we can reward and indeed even punish um, for uh, bad behavior, good and be bad behavior um, in the short term versus the long term and therefore force policymakers to think much long term, more long term in their decision making. I've heard it said that the day after Election Day for a member of the House of Representatives in the United States, because it's a two-year term, they are already on the phone fundraising for next time. Do you yes. think something needs to be done about the shortness of a two-year term for such an important body of Congress? Well, I think we at least need to consider it very seriously. Um, it just seems to me somewhat uh, disconnected given the slate of problems that we have. But also, again, if you look across the world, um, other countries have chosen to extend the terms. So, for example, if you look at a place like Brazil, they have nine-year terms for their senators, and very often you only get one term. So that gives you enough wiggle room to uh, think about these long-term problems, implement policy without that sort of, uh, you know, um, sort of uncomfortableness of having to campaign in the middle of when you're supposed to be doing your job to deliver uh, living standard improvements and general economic improvements um, for your constituents. So I do think there's something that is beneficial for thinking about these things long-term. Um, I'm not so naive as to not understand that there may be downside risks. If, of course, if you elect the wrong person, um, they may you might be stuck with them for longer than you would like. But I think fundamentally, we're dealing with a long-term uh, uh, agenda of problems. And I think we need to encourage and, if anything, uh, you know, strong arm our policymakers to think much more long-term. Now, what about the voters? What kinds of limitations would you like to see on voters? Well, you know, this is a, a, it was a very risky uh, portfolio that I offered in the in the book as part of that uh, the, the menu of ten things that we can do to improve democracies. And it's risky because people are prone to misinterpret what I said. So I'd love to just give myself as an example. I'm, I consider myself pretty well read and pretty well engaged in some of the issues that the global economy is facing. But 
in the case of COVID, I mean, frankly, I do not know with all my knowledge and all my reading um, what the best use of a marginal dollar is. I don't know whether it's better better to pay to pay uh, the, the salaries, increased salaries to doctors or to pay for a bed net or for additional medication. I have absolutely no idea what the best use of that dollar is. But I have to believe that people who work in the healthcare industry, nurses, physical therapists, doctors, etc., have more understanding and knowledge of that. And so one of the proposals that um, I had in there was that we need to be much more knowledge based about how and who is, is allowed to vote on some of these policy initiatives. This is something that uh, has been uh, you know, played around with in Europe and places like Switzerland are looking at different metrics as at age, for example. Um, but also you can think about a whole host of uh, ways to improve your public policy decision making by thinking a bit more uh, strategically about who it is who has the best uh, suite of information to make the policy decisions uh, that we need to be made. Well, that suggests, uh, I mean, it's a kind of a weighted ballot system there, and it, it, it suggests that if you know more about what's going on in your world and are more engaged with it, you will therefore necessarily make a more intelligent decision about who to vote for. Are you sure that's the case? No, and listen, there's no certainty about any of this stuff. All I'm saying is the status quo in the democracy that we have is not good enough. Um, and so what I was doing in my book is to offer a portfolio of options and how we might actually address the weaknesses of democracy and try to improve things. So, you know, I am not saying, you know, hitting the table saying this is absolutely the way forward. What I am saying is that it's we're, we're doing ourselves a great disservice by by not looking at ways to improve democracy. And there are, um, you know, initiatives and there are efforts to trial and error um, better ways to uh, to to really uh, improve democracy. And we should be looking at that much more aggressively and, and honestly. Well, le uh, okay, let me try one more on this, just, uh, just for fun. I have heard somebody put forward the idea that on election day, let's say in the province of Ontario, if you can name who the premier is, the sitting premier of the day, you get a vote. If you can name who the premier and the opposition leader is, you get two votes. If you can name the premier, the opposition leader, and the leader of the third party, you get three votes. What do you think of that idea? Well, again, you know, this idea of weighted voting is being uh, picked apart in many different ways. I mean, it's, you know, funny enough, it's not up to me to say, oh, that's brilliant or that's really dumb. Uh, I think ultimately it's about people having a uh, a discussion with a cool towel on all our heads um, to see what would actually potentially lead to, to better and, and good outcomes. Um, and there is a lot of research on this. A lot of it's cited in my book. Australia is looking at this um, and thinking about how to get the best types of, uh, of uh, democratic outcomes. And, and maybe if I may just illustrate really quickly an example of this, you know, we live in a society, certainly in the United States, where, you know, the whole notion of one man, one vote, even with all the legislative changes that have occurred, is doesn't actually exist. Um, people at low income, in fact, 30% of people at low incomes do not vote. Um, oh, excuse me, they do vote. And the bulk of uh, over 70% of people don't. Um, we've seen very low participation rates, around 50%. Mm -hmm. And yet we're forming public policy based on 50% of people in the country voting. Um, and that's just not good enough. Now, Places like Australia, there are about 19 countries around the world that have decided that they're going to mandate voting uh, and make it a real, not just a, a right, but really an obligation. Um, and I think that, again, we should be having a conversation about that, about that. We talk about diversity and inclusion in corporate boardrooms and in the private sector, but why are we not thinking about broadening diversity and inclusion um, to actually be much more reflected in, in the realm of, uh, of public policy making? So that's just one of the things that I think is really important. And, and again, this is not me on high saying this is exactly where you need to go, but I think we've got a portfolio of options that we should explore. Understood. I want, and I think a Canadian audience would be particularly interested in this question, at least I hope they would be. Do we depend on the United... Joe Biden just finished saying the U.S. is back, right? If Trump basically disengaged from much of the world, Joe Biden has said the U.S. is back and we are engaged. Do the democratic countries of this world depend on American, let's say, preeminence in diplomatic and economic affairs if we're all going to succeed? What a brilliant question. I think the short answer is the jury is out. Um, I think uh, five years ago, the absolute answer, I think, would broadly have been yes, absolutely. The United States um, has been the uh, the sort of 
uh, you know, Paul bearer, if you will, of uh, of many uh, of, of ideals of uh, market capitalism and liberal democracy. Um, and so to see the United States uh, sort of take a step back has left an opening. And I think it's a much more fractured world. We see that in the response to uh, uh, not just uh, COVID in terms of uh, reacting to stem the tide, but also in terms of vaccinations, the multipolar world. And I think it's also true in Europe. We've seen a peel off there. And, you know, behind closed doors, a lot of the public policymakers that I know um, are not shy to say, well, we learned one thing, we should not depend on the United States. Look, I mean, I think the more uh, sort of a uh uh, objective view is that the United States has a whole host of problems, you know, that I outlined for you earlier. They've got a lot of problems that they have to deal with in terms of economic growth, in terms of climate change, in terms of the debt that the United States is carrying. And so the notion that uh, other countries uh, should think it's okay to rely on the United States, um, you know, certainly economically, I think is quite a challenged view, but also uh, I think that they are themselves, the United States is being challenged in terms of its ideological perspective um, with cancel culture and some of these other ideas that have emerged. Um, and so I don't think we should all sit back and wait for the United States to sort of tell us how we should run uh, our political, social and economic affairs. Um, I think that that world has changed materially. I think we're grateful to hear that up here. So thanks for that. <laughs> Uh, I am happy to remind people that the name of your book is Edge of Chaos, Why Democracy is Failing to Deliver Economic Growth and How to Fix It. Dambiza Moyo, it's always good of you to join us here on TVO. Stay safe and thanks so much. See you next time. Bye. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.